Hi everyone, and welcome to today's webinar featuring Foresight IT Solutions and SkySync. Our teams are excited to show you the capabilities we have together relating to migrations. My name is Stephanie Dunn, and I am the CMO of Foresight. I'll be kicking off the webinar and will be introducing our speakers shortly. This is a webinar we have been looking forward to presenting to you for quite a while. We have heard from numerous schools looking to get away from third-party storage providers like Box and move on to a more sustainable platform such as Office 365 due to heavy price increases, streamlining budgets, security management, and a host of other motivators. So for that reason, we have joined with our partner SkySync to highlight a better way to move from Box and take advantage of the built-in storage and collaboration solutions you already have included within your Office 365 licenses, such as OneDrive, Teams, and SharePoint. For many, the migration seems daunting, and we are here to explain how easily the migration can be if done with the right partner and with the right guidance along the way. Today, we are highlighting benefits and best practices of migrating off of a third-party storage solution like Box and onto the included storage and collaboration solutions included in your Office 365 licenses. Our presenters today are migration experts from both Foresight and SkySync. We have Shi Han, Foresight Cloud Engineer, and Russ, SkySync Senior Solutions Architect. Both Shi Han and Russ have years of technical migration experience and shared knowledge to demonstrate a better migration process for your end users. Welcome, Shihan and Russ. We look forward to your expertise and walkthroughs. Before we get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Foresight and who we are as a team. Foresight is a dedicated Microsoft Gold partner, and we're a strategic leader in the IT industry, developing IT infrastructures and creating products that support the success of all organizations. Our goal is to empower organizations to achieve technology goals and objectives with best-in-class employees and advanced technologies. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Shihan, Foresight Cloud Engineer, to begin. Welcome, Shihan. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, hello, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to start with just a brief overview of how we approach a migration project here at Foresight. Um, go through some of the best practices for you and your organization around the planning and preparation stages of migration, and then pass it over to Russ to walk through some of the major challenges presented by these kinds of migrations, and how Foresight and SkySync together can help you navigate them. So our migration process begins with a kickoff, followed by an in-depth envisioning process where we take a look at the relevant environments. So in this case, Box and Officer 65, and the composition of your data stored in those platforms. So at this point, we're assessing it for potential issues around structure, permissions, or metadata. And from there, we start planning the actual migration process. Um, we will get into a little bit more detail about what goes into this planning and prep process later on. But for now, this graphic shows a high-level flow of how we move from planning and preparation to the pilot migration and testing and then eventually all the way through to the execution of the production migration and finally the cutover and knowledge transfer. So uh, next slide, Stephanie. So now we'll discuss a few of the best practices you want to keep in mind in planning any box to Office 365 migration. Um, one of the first steps in the process is mapping users from your box environment to your office tenant. So you can plan what data goes where in Office 365 and to ensure that permissions shared um, both within and if necessary outside of your organization are preserved over the course of the migration. So this process can go in a number of different directions um, depending on your identity management process. Uh, it might involve comparing lists between your environments, updating configuration in your instance of Azure Active Directory Connect, um, or even making changes in your on-prem Active Directory. Um, and the goal of all of this is to ensure that users who have Box data have a provisioned identity in Office 365 that can be mapped back to Box and has the appropriate licensing to have data migrated to platforms like OneDrive for Business, Microsoft Teams, and SharePoint Online. And another recommended step here is to implement group-based licensing which removes the headache, or at least most of the headache, of your Office 365 admin of having to assign and reassign licenses to individual users. And that's a process that can be managed in Azure Active Directory or in your on-prem Active Directory or in some combination of the two. 
Um, the next two steps here are both around assessing the data present in your Box environment. Um, and Box provides some native reporting tools to get this done. Um, so you can evaluate the data present in your Box environment and identify what might not be suitable for migration. So this might be data that results um, from a compromised account and is no longer useful, or data that hasn't been accessed in a certain period of time. And this data would either be need to uh, either need to be excluded from the migration or earmarked for archiving. Um, another step here is to identify integrations with your Box environment that might require additional work during the migration, um, or also identifying common data types used by your end users that might require the use of supplementary technologies to provide the best possible experience for them in Office 365. So now to talk a little bit about the pre-migration preparation of your Office tenant. Um, the first step here, as Stephanie mentioned earlier, is to make some decisions about where to store your data. And so you have three main options here. I'm sure you're familiar with a lot of them. Uh, OneDrive for Business, which is a repository designed for individually owned data, um, but still has some sharing capabilities. SharePoint Online, which as the name implies, is designed for collaboration um, with data being owned primarily by groups. And then Microsoft Teams, um, which is file storage backended by SharePoint Online with some additional collaboration features. So one of the main goals of this part of the project uh, this part of the process rather, <coughs> excuse me, uh, is to avoid the single owner issue when it comes to departmental data. And when I say departmental data, I mean data owned by a collaborative entity such as a department, a working group, a class. Um, the issue here is that if that data is owned by a single person, when that person leaves the organization, moves around within the organization, or has some sort of other status change that requires the ownership to be transferred to another identity. And so the way to avoid this issue is to identify this content in Box and make sure it is mapped appropriately to be owned by a group in either SharePoint Online or Microsoft Team. And another important step here is um, the preparation of your OneDrive for Business sites via PowerShell. So this is a little bit of PowerShell scripting necessary to create the OneDrive for Business sites that will be the destination for your users' data. Um, so this process essentially simulates your users logging into their Office 365 portal and opening that OneDrive application, which simply makes their personal site available as a destination for migration. And so on to the next slide. Um, before I pass it over to Russ, I wanted to touch on a couple migration specific decisions you'll need to make as part of the planning process. Um, among these are how and if you want to preserve file versions present in Box, how you want to map permissions, um, like I mentioned earlier, whether or not to preserve the permission shared outside of your organization, and then how to order the users and groups involved in the migration based on things like priority, size, number of shares, or other organizational factors. And then if this applies to your organization, um, you may want to consider planning the migration timeline to meet benchmarks around your box usage. And finally, we get to the installation and configuration of your SkySync environment that will power the migration. Um, this involves installing the software, standing up your processing and database servers, um, installing SkySync extensions, um, one of the most popular of which is the box notes to Word document conversion, um, and then preparing your user maps and your job templates. And the job So with that, I will pass it over to Russ, who will talk through some of the biggest challenges presented by a box to Office 365 migration and how Foresight and SkySync can help you navigate them successfully. Yeah, thanks, Sheehan. So first of all, who is SkySync? Well, our team is comprised of industry and functional experts really across the ECM uh, gamut. Uh, many of the, the folks in our organization are uh, you know, have past lives in other Microsoft oriented companies. You may have heard of uh, Metalogic Storage Point. We actually, uh, our, our organization really originally wrote that back in the day before it was sold off to, to Metalogics. Um, and there was certainly a period of time there where we, you know, we didn't, we couldn't operate in the Microsoft ecosystem because of that. And what that really did for us is it gave us an opportunity to get really strong in some of these other platforms that are out there, uh, uh, Box primarily being, you know, being the number one. 
uh, outside of Microsoft. So uh, we've got extensive skill sets, you know, you know, as far as across the knowledge base and, and our ability to code against the Box platform. And it's really made for a very compelling solution uh, when folks come to us and say, hey, we really need to get off of Box and go to Office 365. So if you take a, a strong software product that's got you know, the capability to integrate with, with a box and a, an, an Office 365 at a very deep level. And then you add in a, a very strong uh, system integrator partner like, like Foresight, you know, really you come up with this sort of best of breed uh, overall solution that really makes for a, a compelling option to get your content off of this legacy platform. We're gonna be able to tightly integrate really not just with box and Office 365, but really anything. Uh, I know that there's there's some challenges in, in the industry right now, and, and there's good reasons why folks are getting off box and going to Office 365, but that may not be the end of the game. You know, we, we see these kinds of things all the time. Um, business plans change, you know, incentives change, and, you know, just remember that that Foresight and SkySync can, uh, can operate in a scenario that uh, really, you know, we're really just the highway to wherever you want to go. And in this case, we're, we're very strong with uh, getting content from Box to Office 365. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what that looks like. Next slide, please. <laughs> so, I mean, th the question we're answering here, and I think that uh, I think that Sheehan's done a good job of showing you really a lot of steps and a lot of things that have to be thought about in going into a migration from Office 360, I'm sorry, from Box to Office 365. There's a lot of steps there. There's a lot to think about. There's a lot of analysis. And, you know, clearly it's great to have a, a strong partner like Foresight to, to help us with these things. But why don't we just try doing it ourselves? Why do folks not do that? Well, at the end of the day, you know, uh, you know, we like to say that really free isn't free. I mean, there are a number of of costs involved, uh, hidden costs that, and, and really risks that can cause uh, problems when you try to do things on your own or have your end users do it on your own. Not to mention the fact that you saw all the things involved in actually executing a migration of this magnitude. Um, you know, so you know, there's a lot of time invested by by your organization, and we're trying to help you with that. But I want to talk a minute about uh, a little bit about just really some of the common challenges as we we migrate Box to OneDrive for Business. I know she had mentioned that Box has reports that can help us understand some of that content. And those reports are really good as kind of a baseline and they can give you some really good information around, you know, who's, you know, kind of who owns what, you know, some general storage information, things like that. But there is a, an additional level that we can go when you use a tool like SkySync. We have the ability to, to do full scan on the source content and really do even a, a full simulated migration um, from source to destination without ever moving a file. So that helps you identify remediation issues. It helps us to see collections of content by file type or by file size or by you know, user. Um, it'll also you know, flag any potential errors that might occur and really gives us excellent in insight into permissions, which is a very important concept specifically around sharing and collaboration. So if you think about sharing an, you know, something in Box, you know, you've got this folder, you, you know, it's been shared with a number of other people. Those folks in Box are seeing that blue folder in that user interface. You know, if you think about how Box operates, really everything happens at the user account level. There's really no centralized or business data store for contents. You end up with these user accounts that have very wide uh, a very large number of these these coll heavily collaborated on folders. Well, these folders don't always really belong in that account location. They really belong in more of a centralized location. So if you think about why does SharePoint have document libraries and team sites? Well, these are areas that you work on content together. So using the shared, uh, you know, sharing insights reports from SkySync, we can see where those big rocks are. Where are those folders hiding inside all of those user accounts? that basically tell us that, uh, you know, uh, by counts, you know, how many people are we collaborating on with this content? And if we find that there's some, some large islands of collaboration, well, those become good targets to move content over into SharePoint Online and to, uh, and to Teams. And so by, you know, having that capability and that report allows foresight to, to make uh, uh, architectural design decisions and help you uh, help provide that guidance as to when content should go to, to OneDrive for Business and when it should go to SharePoint Online or Teams. 
And then again, uh, you know, we also think about user permissions and we think about, um, you know, moving content over to, um, you know, you know, to that destination. Permissions in Box and permissions in Office 365 are actually quite different. Um, Box uses a waterfall approach, which means that if I have access to a folder, I also have access to everything underneath that folder. Uh, SharePoint Online doesn't work like that. So how do you transform those permissions from Box to a world where that paradigm is similar in Office 365? SkySync does all of that for you. And we also have to uh, think about security and compliance, right? So you've got all this collaboration data, that's important business data, that's important to, you know, to your users. And then you have all the user permissions, um, you know, already, you know, tied to your business, right? Like, you know, we're, we're including and excluding permissions to certain content on purpose, and it has a reason. Without a centralized reporting and auditing of the entire migration process, it becomes very difficult to really ensure that sort of chain of custody, that the content did in fact move from the source all the way to the destination, and you've accounted for everything in that. Uh, so SkySync provides that additional you know, oversight into that, that sharing, that permissions, and the actual tracking of the migrated, migrated content to ensure that, hey, later on, if somebody comes after us or, or we need to be able to produce something or put something on legal hold or provide some discovery, we know that that content made it from the source to the destination. And if it didn't, why didn't it go? Maybe we filtered it on purpose. Maybe there's another good reason we've got that information. Next slide, please. All right, so think about full file fidelity. This is another challenge that we get when end users try to move content from the source to destination. First of all, you know, this concept of box notes and um, being able to, you know, do something in box that really doesn't even exist in Office 365. One of the cool things about SkySync is we have uh, the capability to intercept those box notes and transform them on the fly and convert them over to um, convert them over to Word documents so that they can then, you know, be, you know, be acted upon or or seen in the other the destination. There's really not a real great way to do that uh, manually, you know, by your end users. The other thing too is document version history. You know, getting getting old versions, saving them out, you know, moving them over to the other side, and doing that in the right order so that you maintain that version history. That's something that is nearly impossible to do by an end user. Uh, I mean, theoretically, it can be done, but it is extremely difficult. And uh, generally speaking, you're going to lose that version history and that real that real rich file fidelity that you have in Box will go away. I mean, the minute you perform a manual upload, the last modified date of the document will now become when you uploaded the file uh, in Office 365. So um, SkySync can do some really great things around <clears throat> maintaining all that version history, um, maintaining the uh, and we can and we can control that, right? We can just take the latest version. We can 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 do the uh, you know more recent versions, just the last five, whatever. But we can also do that in a way that uh, you know that uh, ensures that the the uh, that history is maintained across all the platforms, and and we can also retain all those those created by and modified by dates. <clears throat> Remediation. This is another big a big piece of the puzzle, right? So if you think about uh, we kind of talked a little bit about running that pre-analysis or that pre-scan so that'll identify challenges up front. Um, but there are definitely things that you cannot do uh, as an end user, you know, easily. Like, you know, you're not going to realize that there's all these files that you have that might have illegal characters or illegal character segments or illegal what they call thicket containers. There's certain sort of reserved words that Microsoft doesn't allow or certain reserved patterns, like you can't have two periods before a file extension. There's just all kinds of things like that. And if you think about all the time that your end users would have to take, even if it's just a half an hour per user to remediate all that, you're going to lose thousands of hours uh, in productivity while, you know, across your, your, your user base as they work through that. So all those key content attributes, those are things that SkySync is going to pick up. Uh, and, and, you know, as part of the, the pre-remediation process, we're going to identify if there's anything we can't do. Uh, for example, Box will allow you to put thousands of <clears throat> characters in a, in a file name. Um, uh, Microsoft doesn't allow us to do that. There's a 400 character path length limit. So SkySync can do some things to do some path truncation, but there are limits to what we can do and still maintain unique files. So all of those things are very uh, important when you think about uh, do that migration. And finally, campus disruption. Um, you know, 
SkySync is extraordinarily scalable and it allows us to run many migration jobs in parallel at the same time, which allows us to keep a very near real time uh, synchronization between your source system in Box and Office 365. We call this continuous copy. And so we're constantly streaming changes over that happen from the store source to the destination. And this includes not just uh, files and folders being added, but also um, you know things like uh, you know deletes. I mean, we can actually propagate the deletes from the source to the destination so that when it comes time to cut over, your end users are not confused. And so if you think about what that means in the larger scheme of change management and cutover, that means that we can be streaming all that content over from source to destination and all of your users can continue using the platform and box as they normally would. You don't have to have confusion over who's been cut over, who hasn't been cut over because we're all using the same source system. And then, you know, certainly the folks in my, you know, my direct sphere of influence, my group or my department, at the very least, we're going to cut them all over at the same time very, very quickly. And there's, and there's a relatively low amount of downtime and minimal impact to end users. So that's much better scenario than if we have Johnny, he, he goes and migrates his stuff on Monday. And then Susie, she goes and migrates her stuff two weekends later you know, which, you know, if, they, if they're sharing that content and collaborating on it, which version are they using? Are they using the version on Box? Are they using the version on OneDrive for Business? This gets extremely complicated very, very quickly. And by, by having all that content cut over at the same time, we substantially minimize disruption. So I think those are kind of the big rocks. You know, if you think about, uh, you know, what we've addressed, you know, really at the end of the day, uh, we've done these things for, for other organizations, for other, uh, you know, educational institutions. And, you know, it's been very, very successful. In the past five months, we've moved over five and a half petabytes, uh, 320,000 users, many, several big ten schools from Box to OneDrive. It, it's a proven process. It's a hardened process. It's something that we have a predictable outcome with, and we can really absolutely help you guys with that as well. So I think that's uh, I think that's just about all I've got. Perfect. Thank you, Russ, and thank you, Shihan. I really, really appreciate you going through all of this. Um, Stephanie, next slide, please. So um, I am Susie McClure, and I've been in the migration space for probably about 10 years now, and I loved what Russ was talking about, right? You know, one of the most daunting tasks of a migration is the planning, and it is the communication. And from a foresight side, I just, you know, wanted to tell you that we do have an entire sales team to help you with that. We do have pre-sales engineers that can help you understand the messaging to the users and what you need to do to migrate first. Um, and then we also help you with all the services. So I can say wholeheartedly that I've probably seen pretty much every migration scenario there is. And Box is potentially one of the most difficult ones to do. So I've seen a lot of universities try to do it themselves. And unfortunately, as Russ kind of was talking about, you know, it, it is a task that, you know, potentially could get messed up very, very quickly. So I'd love for you guys to reach out, even just a quick conversation to understand what that looks like. Um, and we can definitely help get you started and get you on the right path. So we do have quite a few questions in the chat. So I'm going to go the first one. So it says, you mentioned box price increases at the beginning of the webinar. How much of an increase are you seeing um, how much of an increase are you seeing? So it has been about almost a 2x to 3x increase. Um, there have been some interesting areas going on, you know, with the box side of it, but, you know, we've seen a mass exodus of education entities from box because specifically in the education space, box has decided to, to increase that. So, um, just an FYI, we've been seeing a lot of customers. Unfortunately, because you know the size of data that they had in Box, they would, you might have to potentially renew just for at least a year. Um, but we have seen a lot of people move, moving after, you know, during that time, just because of this increase. Okay, next question is how long does a migration usually take? So Shihana Russ, would you like to take that one? Yeah, I can start us off. So. We get that question a lot, um, and it's a, it's a pretty difficult question to answer. Um, I think the intuitive factors there are the number of users you have and the amount of data they have. 
associated to them. Um, but in addition to that, we have to consider how that data is distributed, um, whether it's spread across a lot of users or kind of centralized to a few. And then in another layer there is um, how the file size is distributed. So we're talking about a number of large files or a bunch of smaller files, um, the latter of which would take a longer time. Um, I think Rust might have some more specific metrics around that, but I guess the short answer is until we do some analysis on your environment and see exactly what you've got, it's difficult to estimate exactly how long a migration is going to take. No, I completely agree with Sheehan. Those those are certainly the big rocks. I mean, you know, the other the other factor is uh, is really migration uh, throughput as far as available bandwidth. And fortunately for us, uh, Box to Office 365 is one of our best use cases um, because you're dealing with Box in their data center. You'll deploy SkySync in an Azure data center or uh, a similar uh, you know IaaS system. So you're going to have a, access to a lot of bandwidth. And then at that point, it kind of comes down to, again, how that data breaks down, which will drive sort of the architecture of like what, how many servers to use for SkySync. Uh, and, and SkySync is extremely efficient with hardware utilization. So we have the ability to certainly, uh, you know, take full advantage of whatever hardware we're able to throw at it. Um, I guess the, the key takeaway there is it can be very, very uh, it can it can it can take it can operate at your speed. Like if you've got a renewal coming up, we can scale up and get to a, a really really fast rate of of migration speed. Um, you know, but if if you've got the time, we can slow roll it as well a little bit if if we need to for change management. And and Russ, while we're kind of on this topic, um, I do have another question regarding installing a software client. So can you give a little bit of clarification about you know the Azure instance or what they potentially need for that installation? Yeah, so SkySync is actually operates as a Windows service. It's not a SaaS solution, and we've chosen to go that way for a couple of different reasons. The primary one is based around security. There's no uh, there's no black box out there that we're sending this data through. It moves directly from the box source, streams through the SkySync uh, uh, memory, like you know VM, never touches the file system. It's not there's no data at rest, and then it gets pushed directly into uh, Azure File Store as it gets imported into Office 365. So there, there's no black box out there. So for that reason, we operate in the security context of the customer, which is typically going to be an Azure VM, uh, preferably co-located in the same region as where your uh, your tenant is located to eliminate the uh, the latency between the, the 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 endpoints. But yes, it's a it's a it's a um, it is a Microsoft Windows service. It's going to run in Windows. We actually can do some other things with Kubernetes and stuff. We just don't typically see that. Um, but for the most part, 99% of the folks are going to deploy it in a VM in, in IaaS in Azure. Perfect. Thank you. And I'm probably just going to take about maybe two more questions. Um, so I know there's a, been quite a few questions in, in the chat regarding specific scenarios. So, you know, we can discuss that with you a little bit further, but we, yes, we do do box to SharePoint, box to OneDrive, box to Teams. Um, and then we can get with you specifically just to help you understand what that process looks like. I think it's probably a little bit too um, too deep to get into in, a, in, a, in this question and answer, but we'd be happy, happy to reach out and kind of walk you through that process. Um, next question is, can you use OneDrive Teams while your the migration is in process? You you can. I'm going to take this one, Sheehan, if you don't mind. Uh, there, there's a, uh, a a specific you know concept here where SkySync can actually do full bidirectional synchronization. Um, we um, you know we 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 got to be careful with that because the biggest issue with it is it causes can it can cause confusion to end users. It, you know, as to determine which, you know, am I operating in the source or am I operating in the destination? But if you're already using OneDrive for Business and Teams, you know, in, the, in that Officer 65 environment, we can support a full bi-directional, you know, synchronization between the two. Uh, we like to try to do that with a limited some set of data so that we're not just confusing the entire organization. Um, but, you know, in specific use cases, if you if you need to have some folks operate in both places, we can certainly support that. Do you have anything to add to that, uh, Sheehan? I, I think that covers it. Perfect. And then let's take two more questions, um, just because we keep getting so many in here, and I know we do have some time, so I'd love to make sure that we get to some of these. Um, I see, can groups be automatically created for shared box content? I, I can take that question. Um, yeah, so I mean, 
the groups are not automatically created. So, so uh, SkySync uh, will um, will basically move files and folders, and we can move those those permissions as well. You kind of have to understand how sharing works in Office 365. So, the cool thing with with uh, SkySync is that we can migrate that sharing permission, and even with external shared users, we can migrate that external shared permission. So when the content gets moved over, uh, we'll migrate it in the context of the person who owns it. And then when it gets to the other side, for anyone who we who that content is shared with, we'll reshare that content with them in Office 365. So that uh, when you go into your, like your uh, OneDrive for Business, you'll actually see a shared content location in your left nav. And that'll be a list of all the content that's been shared with you, kind of a little bit similar to those blue folders you see in Box. So we can support that, um, but automatically creating groups doesn't really make a lot of sense as far as um, you know, automatically manufacturing like a security group, and it's something we kind of stay away from. We can certainly support group mapping if we if we have a defined you know set of users in a group that that we need to uh, map from source to destination. Perfect. And then we have one more question, and I think I can answer this because I'm not sure uh, Shihan's unmute is working. But it says, does your company handle migrations that involve moving HIPAA data from Box to OneDrive? Um, and that is an absolute yes. So we've done a lot of migrations specifically for teaching colleges who are associated with, um, you know, with a hospital or someone who is really strong in the HIPAA compliance. So we understand everything that goes into the HIPAA law and um, and we are HIPAA compliant, you know, with the SkySync, the Azure um, and everything that is involved in this particular migration. Okay, with that, I just wanted to say, again, thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna hand it back over to Stephanie um, so she can kind of close out the meeting. Thank you, Susie. And thank you, Shihan and Russ for the valuable information. It looks like we have one more question that's come in at the last minute and I will take that one. Uh, the question is, what tips do you have for communicating this change to our end users? Yeah, this is a great question and something we have received many times. We recommend communicating to your end users in a positive, supportive way, either through email messaging or website announcements. Uh, we feel communication is key. Communicate early, communicate often, and try to anticipate what your end user might be asking of you. At Foresight, we supply our customers with professionally written emails, website copy, data sheets, and other resources that can help in the transition. And uh, we do recommend providing cutover timelines helpful links, product guides, really anything that will help aid in that end user adoption and change management. Um, so with that, it looks like we have no further questions and we'll sign off for now. We appreciate your time with our teams today and hope to engage with you in the near future. If you have any additional questions, please send them over to info at foresightit.com and we will answer you right away. We're here to help and we appreciate the opportunity to support you. Thank you all and we hope you have a great rest of your day.